أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والضحى والليل إذا سجى ما ودعك ربك وما قلى ولا الآخرة خير لك من الأولى ولسوف يعطيك ربك فترضى ألم يجدك يتيما فآوى ووجدك ضالا فهدى ووجدك عائلا فأغنى فأما اليتيم فلا تقهر وأما السائل فلا تنهر وأما بنعمة ربك فحدث بسم الله from the um from the seer of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم I've been given the task tonight to give you a little glimpse of the tests that the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم went through the ابتلاء and so what I want you to do instead of looking at this from the third person I want you to look at it from the first person as if these events had happened to you as if the events had happened to you so when I say that this such and such happened what I want you to imagine is if it had happened to you alright and so the Prophet ﷺ was born and immediately after that his father died and so the Prophet ﷺ grew up with no father he was raised by his mother and at a very young age <coughs> the Prophet ﷺ lost his mother as well and so now even in his infancy when he's just in the age of around six years old seven years old he's now going into the world with no mother and no father and so his grandfather begins to take care of him and love him Abdul Muttalib and as Abdul Muttalib is taking care of him Abdul Muttalib soon dies as well and now he's lost his father who he never knew he's lost his mother and he's lost his grandfather and he's an orphan in Mecca his uncle Abu Talib begins to take care of him the Prophet was never known for any of the vices that the Quraysh were known for, the, the people in Mecca they would drink alcohol or they would uh, they would drink alcohol or bury their women or whatever it was that there the Prophet ﷺ had nothing to do with that he was as they knew him to be the most trustful person in their entire society As-Sadiq Al-Amin not only that but when Khadija radiallahu anha who was a very successful businesswoman in Mecca she would send out the caravans she noticed that this was a man that was of the most or the most trustworthy amongst all the men and so she placed him in charge of her caravan that would go to Syria and come back and so the Prophet وسلم, at that time hadn't received revelation he was 25 years old he took care of her caravan and where everybody else was just going making a profit and coming back with the Prophet the Prophet وسلم, went to Mecca sorry went to Syria made a profit and then bought items and then when he came back to Mecca he also sold it in Mecca so he got double the profit Khadija radiallahu anha asked her uncle to speak to Muhammad وسلم, about getting married and they got married it was uh, his first wife Khadija radiallahu anha and from Khadija he had the majority of his children <coughs> when the Prophet وسلم, received revelation in the beginning he uh, as he um, he went and it was getting older and towards uh, age 40 the Prophet وسلم, used to go up to a cave and that cave till today if you go to the Kaaba and you're standing in the Kaaba you will notice all these huge hotels around the Kaaba I think they're building a new hotel there it's huge but there's still a mountain that you can see right when you're doing tawaf 
Some of you might, if you've been to Mecca, you don't recognize that mountain. But there's a huge mountain in the distance that isn't covered by hotels. And from the courtyard of the Kaaba, you can see it. That's Ghari Hira. That's the cave of Hira. And that's where the Prophet ﷺ, it's an extremely difficult climb. Right? If you're thinking, yeah, I want to go visit there, it's maybe an hour walk upwards. It's extremely high, bigger than those high hotels. The Prophet ﷺ used to go there and worship. At-Tahannath. And you'll see this in Sahih Bukhari. It's the, one of the first hadiths. The Prophet ﷺ, he loved to go up to the mountain of, uh, go up into the cave of Hira and contemplate the situation that his people and humanity was in. And the vices that were happening and so on. And on that mountain, the Prophet ﷺ, you can imagine the fear that comes to a person when you're just alone in a cave on the top of a mountain and then a man appears. And so he's on, and then the man is telling him to read. And so the Prophet ﷺ said to him, he said, I can't read. And a lot of people forget this part about that story, and many of you are familiar with it. Jibreel السلام, Angel Jibreel, he grabbed the Prophet ﷺ and he squeezed him. And he pressed him so hard. So not only the fear of seeing that person there, but he pressed him so hard. Until the Prophet ﷺ said, I felt I was going to die. And then he let go of him. And then he said, read. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I can't read. And then he squeezed him again. Until the Prophet ﷺ said, that I felt I was going to die. And then he said to him, read. He said, I can't read. And then he pressed him again, until he felt he was going to die. And then Jibreel ﷺ told him, اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as he was walking away and he saw Jibreel in this stance in another point afterwards he saw Jibreel in his original creation covering the entire horizon Nobody saw Jibreel, but the Prophet ﷺ saw him. And so he came home frightened. And his wife Khadija, she said, what's wrong? And he said, just cover me up. And he was shaking. He said, zammiluni, zammiluni. He said, just cover me up. The Prophet ﷺ was so scared about what had taken place. And in fact, after that Khadija ﷺ, you'll see in the seerah, she said, Allah would never do this to you. Allah would never disgrace you or humiliate you. Because you fulfill the ties of kinship. You're good to the orphans. If anybody needs help, you're the one who helps them. You feed them, you take care of them. You will never be humiliated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the Prophet sallallahu after that revelation discontinued. You will see that for many months, Jibreel didn't come back until he felt that Allah was angry with him. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed one of the first surahs to be revealed amongst after Surah Iqra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala received, uh, revealed Surah Al-Duha. وَالْضُحَى وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by the daybreak that he hasn't abandoned you and he's not angry with you. And so it's a preparation to prepare the Prophet ﷺ for the enormous tests that are about to come. And so the Prophet ﷺ in the beginning he wasn't told to tell the people about Islam. He had just received revelation. And so the Prophet ﷺ he went about and began teaching people secretly. And so you hear about Darul Arqam. You hear about Darul Arqam. When the Prophet ﷺ was told to publicly announce Islam, to publicly teach the people and publicly call them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine his happiness that this is the moment where all his people become Muslim. 
that he's going to tell them and they're going to go to Jannah and everybody will be saved and so he brought them he called them on the mountain the mountain the mountain of Safa actually when people go for Umrah when you visit the Kaaba you're standing on the same mountain that the Prophet ﷺ stood on when he made this announcement and so he called them out the Prophet ﷺ he said oh Bani Fihr he's calling them out oh Bani Fihr ya Bani Fihr Bani Fihr, the tribe of Bani Fihr, they came to the mountain. The Prophet ﷺ said, O Banu Adi, the tribe of Adi comes to the mountain. And he started calling them out, tribe by tribe by tribe. They left the marketplaces, everybody left what they do. They said, this is As-Sadiq, this is the truthful one. This is Al-Ameen, the trustworthy one who's calling us. And so they all gathered around. Because this was a place, and the way he was calling them, was how someone who had just seen an attacking army would be calling them. Basically, when there's um, a bomb, and may Allah protect us, but in those countries you may have heard, when there's an airstrike that's about to happen, a certain siren goes off. And even, Allah Alam, I remember in Winnipeg where I grew up, there was an IGA. You guys remember IGA? There was an IGA and they said, if you go to IGA, down the street from where our school was, there are bomb sirens on top of the of the of the supermarket. Back in the day in the in the world wars, that if you know um, you know these people or that people had attacked, the sirens would go off. They were never used. Alhamdulillah, and we never grew up in that kind of you know hearing those sounds. But when you hear that sound, this was what the Prophet said. This was in Mecca, 1400 years ago. This was that sound. And so he told them that if I tell you that there's an army behind this mountain about to attack you, because this is what the siren is about, would you believe me? And they said, yes, we would. You're a sadiq al amin And so he says, فَإِنِّي نَذِيرٌ لَكُمْ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ عَذَابٍ شَدِيدٌ Then I'm warning you of a punishment that's coming right between your hands. And so out of everybody that was standing there, his own uncle, his own family, cursed him out in front of everybody. He said, Tabalak. He said, May you perish, may you be destroyed. You gathered us for that reason. And Abu Lahab walked away. And all the people turned their backs on the Prophet. A moment that he was expecting them to all become Muslim became the moment of the greatest test that any man has gone through. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Lahab. Tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tab ma aghna anhu maluhu wa ma kasab sayasla naran that lahab wa mratuhu hamalatal hatab fi jidiha hablum mim masad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said Tabbat yada Abi Lahab bin Watab that the two hands of Abu Lahab have perished and he has perished. Ma aghna anhu maluhu wa ma kasab All his wealth and everything that he's accumulated in life will avail him nothing. But then began the trials against the Prophet and they couldn't really physically punish the Prophet so they had to punish him emotionally and punish his followers physically, those of whom they could. And so began the name calling. And amongst the, the name calling, there's actually a lot of names that the Prophet ﷺ was accused with. And as the Quraysh gathered together, they said, what shall we call him? And all of these names at a certain point, they had accused him of. The first one was Al-Kahin, the Soothsayer. Basically like a fortune teller. And so they called him a kahin and they would go around telling people that he's a kahin. They called the Prophet wasallam a sha'ir, a poet. Someone who just comprised some lines of poetry and now he's presenting it to the people claiming that he's a prophet. They called the Prophet wasallam a sahir, a magician. And in fact, this was one of the, out of the different names that they had used against the Prophet ﷺ, this was the one that they focused on most. 
Because when people would convert to Islam and people would come back and listen to the Prophet ﷺ, they would say that they've they've fallen under a, a spell, and they've and that he's divided the families just like a magician divides the family. They told they um they claim that the Prophet ﷺ obviously witchcraft is a totally different science. It's about blowing on knots. It's like voodoo and all of those things, the black magic that you hear. And everyone knew that the Prophet ﷺ had nothing to do with that. In fact, at one point, there was the story of a man whom, when he came to Mecca to, you know, uh, you know, to grant, give his respects to the Kaaba, they had told him that there's this man named Muhammad who's a complete, you know, he's mentally ill, he's a magician, he'll throw like witchcraft on you, he's possessed by devils. And so he, and this man, he said, um, and this is actually in Sahih Muslim, he said, I was so afraid and that I would go around the Kaaba and he would say something to me, just whisper it behind my back or something like that, and I would fall under the spell. He said, so much so that I wanted to take like cotton and stuff my ears while I circumambulated the Kaaba, while I was doing tawaf. And so this man, he saw the Prophet him sitting in the courtyard reading Qur'an. And so every time he passed by, this man was actually a doctor, and he was from a, a big tribe. He said, he started feeling pity for Muhammad wasallam. And as every time he went by and he saw him, he said, you know what? I've heard the statements of all the soothsayers. I've heard, I've, I've dealt with, people have been possessed, people have been, you know, afflicted by devils and jinns. And so he said, I'm going to help him. Uh, he finished like his tawaf and then he went to the Prophet him, and he said to him, I'm a doctor. I hear you're sick. I hear you like mentally you've you know you're possessed by jinns and I want to help you. The Prophet ﷺ responded to him by saying, Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu, wa nasta'inuhu, wa nasta'hdi, man yahdi allahu, wa huwa al-muhdad, wa man yudlil, fala hadiya la, wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah, wahdahu la sharika la, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu rasul. This man then said to him, he said, Can you say that again? <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ said it again. In alhamdulillah, verily all pr praise belongs to Allah. We praise Him, we seek His help. Whoever Allah guides, there's no one that can misguide them. And whoever Allah allows to go astray, nobody can guide them aright. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that I'm the Messenger of Allah. This man, he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He said, I swear by Allah that I've heard the statements of the magicians, those possessed by devils, the jinns, the crazy. He said, I swear by Allah, this is not the words of those who are possessed. And so began the name calling of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And you're getting a little glimpse that nobody came to Mecca except that they heard and of the backbiting and the slander that was against the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "وَقَالُوا يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ أُزِلَ عَلَيْهِ الذِّكْرُ إِنَّكَ لَمَجْنُونٌ." And they said to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ أُزِلَ عَلَيْهِ الذِّكْرُ O ye who had the remembrance revealed to him, إِنَّكَ لَمَجْنُونٌ." You're crazy. You're a madman. This is the Prophet ﷺ, who they only years before were testifying that he was the most truth truthful amongst them, which they knew. They also used to cut the Prophet ﷺ off when he spoke. And so when the Prophet ﷺ would begin speaking to people, and people would gather around to hear the verses of the Qur'an, they had a man who was good at storytelling. And so this man, every time the Prophet ﷺ stood up, he basically stood up beside him and went on a story of, you know, the Persians and, you know, a thousand nights in one night, you know, those kind of stories. He would start going into fairy tales. He was the Arabian folk teller. When he would finish his story, then he would say, 
that I'm telling stories and Muhammad is telling stories. And the only thing that he is telling you is Asatirul Awaleen. Is nothing more than the stories of those who came before. They're just folk tales and fairy tales. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَقَالُوا أَسَاطِيرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ اكْتَتَبَهَا فَهِيَ تُمْلَى عَلَيْهِ فَهِيَ تُمْلَى عَلَيْهِ بُكْرَةً وَأَصِيلًا And they say, أَسَاطِيرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ And they say that it is folk tales and fairy tales of those who came before him. اكتتبها He wrote it with his own hands. فَهِيَ تُمْلَى عَلَيْهِ It's being dictated to him بُكْرَةً asila In the mornings and the evenings. Meaning that he's a con artist that has some guy out in the mountain that dictates to him the, these stories and then he just comes to you and he tells you the stories. <coughs> the Prophet ﷺ This began the name calling, the emotional torture until about the fourth year of Hijrah where the actual physical torture began. And so some of the Prophet Sallallahu closest family was tortured. Amongst them, Uthman Radiallahu An. Now Uthman Radiallahu An who was amongst, uh, from the most noblest of family. Why was he tortured? And the answer is that his own uncle tortured him. What they would do is even the noble, I mean obviously the, the weaker of the Muslims were tortured, no one could defend them. But those who were even from uh, affluent families would still be tortured by their own family members. And so this is not some foreign person torturing them. This is their own blood. Affan, uh, Uthman ibn Affan anhu, by his uncle, he would be placed on palm trees and underneath the fire would be lit so that his back would burn. And so when you hear about the migration to Abyssinia, to uh, Habasha, Uthman anhu, was part of that. He would say, why, is he, why did he go? And it's because of his own family's torture against him. And Uthman was married to the daughter of the Prophet You'll see someone like Mus'ab ibn Umayr who was from the most wealthiest families in Mecca. And who, you know, he had the finest clothes and the sweetest smelling perfumes. He was, you know, the coolest kid. But he believed in the Prophet and when his mother had found out, she boycotted him. She took everything away from him. Everything. Until he went to Medina and he was killed in one of the battles, Shaheed, and they didn't have enough clothing to cover his dead body. And he died, Shaheed. And so they said that his skin that was so soft before, you know, he had all those lotions and all those things that affluent families have. It wasn't like that when he went to Medina. And he did all of that for the sake of Islam. Not only the physical torture, but you can imagine that the Prophet ﷺ has to see this by his own eyes and can't do anything about it. And so it's not only that, you, that someone's being tortured, but you also see it happening. And you can't do anything about it as well. And so of those examples was the family of Yasir. And the family of Yasir, um, Ammar ibn Yasir and his, his uh, sorry, Ammar ibn Yasir, his father was Yasir, radiallahu anhu majma'een, and his mother was Sumayya. And Sumayya radiallahu anha and her husband Yasir, they were slaves. And they were being tortured to the maximum. But yet they wouldn't recant and they wouldn't say a word of kufr. They wouldn't say a word of disbelief. And so Sumayya radiallahu anha is written in the history books as the first woman to be martyred. The first woman, woman to be killed shaheed in the path of Allah. She was tortured to the point of death. Tortured to the point of death. And so the Prophet wasallam would pass by them. And they're being tortured to the point of death. They were both killed in torture. And Ammar ibn Yasir did hijrah to Medina without his mother and father. The Prophet ﷺ would see them being tortured and he would say to them, Sabran. He'd say to them, be patient. Be patient. It's not that they're going to actually get out of this torture in this life. 
He's like, be patient because you have an appointment in paradise. And so they never recanted their faith until today. Our tears are for them, but actually they're for us. Because they gave their lives for the sake of Islam. They didn't recant. Sabran ala yasir, fa'inna mawadukum al jannah. And you see Bilal radiallahu anhu. Bilal, that everybody knows the story of Bilal radiallahu anhu, that they would pass by seeing Bilal. It's not that Bilal was tortured and then later on they found out about him. They saw him being tortured every single day. They saw him. And so they used to hear him say, Ahadun Ahad. Underneath the rocks that he was being pressed into the ground for his back to burn, they heard him say, Ahadun Ahad. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu would say, Yunjik al Wahidun Ahad. That the one that you're calling is going to save you. And so this is the torture that they went through. And so you'll see that they went through this. On top of that, you had one of the companions who was also a slave, who was tortured. Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu anhu, who was a great companion. But a great lesson was taught to him and all of us. Khabbab ibn al-Arat, ibn al-Arat radiallahu anhu, he was once tortured. And he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and he was angry. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, Ala tad'u lana. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, won't you make dua for us? Won't you pray for us? And the Prophet ﷺ, he got angry. He said that there were people that came before you. That they were buried in the ground. And their bodies, the skin of their bodies, they had metal combs that they used to tear their skin, every part of their skin was torn away from their body, separated from the meat of their body. And they would be cut in half because of their faith in Allah. But that didn't make them turn their back on, on, on believing in Allah. He said, وَلَكِنَّكُمْ تَسْتَعْجِنُونَ He said, but you're hasty. You're hasty. And this was in Mecca. And Khabbab ibn al-Arat understood that it's an issue of patience. And so you'll see that the Prophet ﷺ, this is all just Mecca, these are the beginning years. This is just the beginning. And they're not fighting back. They're not picking up hands, they're not picking up arms. It's just torture, punishment. Mentally, emotionally, physically, they're just anything that they could think of. Any type of punishment that you can think of, the Quraysh did it to the Prophet ﷺ. Prophet ﷺ in those Mecca years, he lost his uncle Abu Talib. The only one that was protecting him. This whole time. The way that the reason they couldn't physically harm the Prophet ﷺ was because of Abu Talib, his uncle's position. He wouldn't allow them to harm him. Abu Talib died. And he died without Islam. And so his own uncle, the Prophet ﷺ wanted so desperately after all that he had helped, that he would die on Islam. And as we said, imagine you have a relative that close to you, someone who had taken care of you for 40 years, and they die on kufr. They die on disbelief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you can ask the brothers and sisters, those who have converted to Islam, what it feels like to have your parents not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I remember in, in Medina University, there's a lot of brothers that, that come from different countries. And one of the brothers, he got a letter. In those days, there's brothers from Africa. And a lot of those countries, they're, um, they're Christian. And he had a letter in class. And I remember this. I was you know, studying Arabic in Medina University. And everybody was so happy for the brother. And, they, and the teacher came in. And then they, they told the teacher, they said, we have good news. He said the brother just received a letter from, from Africa that his father had become Muslim. And the whole class celebrated for the brother. Because this is his own father. This was something that the Prophet ﷺ didn't get. He had his uncle die, not in a state of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, 
إنك لا تهدي من أحببت You can't guide who you love to guide ولكن الله يهدي من يشاء But rather it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who guides whomever he wishes And soon after that Khadija radiallahu anha died His wife after all these years Who had taken care of him Who had used her wealth to assist him who as we just said a few moments ago was there when he received the first revelation he lost them both both one after the other and now basically his family has no protection and his wife has died and he has to spread on this message how often have you seen people when they say that I'm in so much grief I can't focus on my salah I'm in the middle of a divorce or my wife has died and everybody says we understand don't come to work don't, uh, you know, don't, you know, don't worry about this, don't worry about that. The person puts aside their missions. But that wasn't an option for the Prophet So he went to At-Ta'if to look for help. That perhaps there would be someone in At-Ta'if that would protect him. Because they were going to kill him. Because he has no protection now. So he went to At-Ta'if. And in At-Ta'if, he went to the chiefs of the people of al taif It's a city out on outside of Mecca. And he told them about Islam and he told them to believe in Allah, asking for protection and, and the great reward that they would have. And so the people of al taif rejected the Prophet And they said, get out of our town. And actually this day, Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet she said, was the battle of Uhud where 70 of your companions were killed shaheed was that the hardest day in your life of the da'wah he said no it wasn't he said the hardest day of my da'wah was on that day of al-ta'if when the prophet وسلم, walked away from the chiefs the chiefs told all the slaves in al-ta'if and all the children and all the foolish people to pick up their rocks and to stone the Prophet ﷺ. So he didn't walk out of the town, he walked out stoned. Until the Prophet ﷺ, he walked away from a ta'if and he sat by himself. And Jibreel ﷺ came down to him. And he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heard what you said to your people. And he heard what they said back. And this is the angel of the mountains. At your command, he will destroy them. And the mountains will destroy, the, the people of Atta'uf will be destroyed. And then the Prophet said, I'm in that, and I'm telling you, it's, it was a more painful experience than the battle of Ahad. The Prophet said, no. He said, perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring from their children people who will believe that there's no God but Allah and that I'm the messenger of Allah. Al-Ta'if, for those who don't know, when the Prophet sallam died, it was one of the few places that kept firm on their Islam. It was one of the most blessed places after the Prophet sallam had died. He returned to Mecca and someone had given him sanct uh, sanctuary but only for a little time as they gathered together to see what they should do with the Prophet some of them said we should jail him and they said no some of them said we should expel him and they said no they said the only solution is to kill him as people had began leaving Mecca to go to Medina and in fact, when the Prophet ﷺ used to go from tribe to tribe in Hajj time, they would all gather in Hajj. The Prophet ﷺ used to say to them, "Qulu la ilaha illallah tuflihu." Say that there's no god but Allah, and you will be successful. And the people would hear him speaking, and then they would say after that, "Who's this man who keeps following him around, calling him a liar, calling him a magician?" They said that's his uncle. 
who would go behind the footsteps of the Prophet and ridicule him. But there was a blessed group of people who came from Medina, the Aus and the Khazraj, the tribes. And they heard the message and there were Jews who lived in Medina who used to say that a Prophet was coming. And when they saw the Prophet ﷺ, they knew that this is who the Jews were speaking about. This was the chosen one. This was the promised Prophet. And so they believed in the Prophet ﷺ. When Al-Abbas, Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, they had a secret meeting in Hajj time and with the people of Medina. And he said, that he's protected. We will protect him here in, in, in Mecca. But if we hand him over to you, do you promise to protect him like you protect your women and children? And they said, we promise to protect him. And they pledged allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ, Al-Bay'ah. And that area was known as Al-Aqaba. And so it was known as Bay'at Al-Aqaba. They pledged allegiance to defend the Prophet ﷺ as they would defend their women and their children. And so the Prophet ﷺ went to Medina but only after they had put a ransom that he be killed at any price. And so that night, Ali radiallahu anhu went to sleep to die in the bed of the Prophet ﷺ because they had surrounded the house and they were going to kill him. Multiple tribes were going to kill the Prophet ﷺ together. And so during the night, the Prophet ﷺ escaped. And he went on his journey to Medina. And there's more to go. In, in Medina, you have the Battle of Badr. You have the Battle of Uhud. You have the Battle of Al-Khandaq. You have the conquest of Mecca. You have multiple battles in which companion after companion was killed shaheed. You have in Medina, when people started spreading rumors about the Prophet ﷺ's wife, that she had done this and she had done that. And they hurt the Prophet ﷺ from his family, from inside. And you keep going on and on and on about what the Prophet ﷺ went through. What keeps a person strong? What keeps a person strong during these trials? Number one is unshakable belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that they might go through the trial. No matter how intense it is, their belief and their faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unshakable. And so that keeps them strong. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as for the foam, like the foam on the sea, it disappears because it's just scum, it's just, it's filthy, there's no benefit to it. In time, it just disappears. But rather that which benefits the, pe benefits the people, it's established in the land. Secondly, is their belief in the hereafter. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا Or Allah Azza wa Jalla says that they feed for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Miskeen, the, the needy, the orphans, and the, and the prisoners. And they say, إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ That we're feeding you for the sake of Allah. And all of this, all of this charity, all the lives that they're giving is because of their belief in the hereafter. Because they know that the reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're not seeking thanks from anybody. And they're not seeking any worldly reward for it. Thirdly, that the Qur'an was always with them. And so you saw, for example, when Abu Lahab had said what he said to the Prophet ﷺ, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala re revealed Surah Lahab. You saw when the Prophet ﷺ uh, uh, feared for his life and the revelation was, discontin uh, was uh, discontinued for some portion, for, for some time. 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Al-Duha. Revealed Surah Al-Duha. And so the Quran was always there, teaching them stories of those who came before, the lessons of those who came before, and how they were patient, and how ultimately success is always for the believer. Which is point number four. That success is always for the believer. There is absolutely no doubt in that. There is absolutely no doubt that the one who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ultimately be the victor. There's no doubt in that. You will see in story after story in the Quran, as you see the story of Hud, and you see the story of Salih, you see the story of Musa alayhi salam, you see the story of Isa alayhi salam, always. In the end, you will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ That the end is always for the believer is always for the muttaqeen. They will always be victorious in the end. And no one can take that victory away from them. But the person has to be patient and see that final end. In conclusion, I want us to just give you a little something that you can take with you, inshallah, that um, as we said, we want all these lectures to be something that's effective, something that actually has an effect in your lives and it has an effect when you start asking yourself the question how can I use this? How can I use this for my own life? And so one of the things that you have to realize, and I'll give you this analogy, is once a doctor and, and the doctor was standing, you know, he'd come out of, uh, of his hospital and there's like a, a river that's nearby and so on and he sees someone going down the river and they're drowning. And so the doctor, he says, I'm a doctor, I can save you. He jumps in the water, pulls the guy out, and he's like doing mouth-to-mouth, CPR, all of the deal. And the guy's like, okay. And as he's saving this person, someone's coming down the stream. The doctor's like, I can save you, I can save you. He jumps in the stream, pulls the person out, brings out CPR, doing the, and you know, he's saving him. The person like, cough out. They, they come back. And then someone else is coming down the stream. And he's like, I can save you, I can save you. He jumps in the water, pulls him out, does mouth-to-mouth -mouth CPR, and right? I don't think, are you guys getting what's happening here? Then he sees two people coming down the stream. He's like, I don't know if I can save two people. But he tries, it's difficult, he's saving them. And then it just hits him. That this isn't the problem. These people who are going down the stream. The problem is, who's throwing them in the water? What is the cause? That's what the problem is. And so he's a smart doctor. I'm not any doctors here? <laughs> no doctors. Okay, a lot of doctors are smart. We know this, right? That's why they get paid more than most of them. <sighs> he goes down the stream and he finds a madman grabbing people and throwing them into the water. So he does like a citizen's arrest or something like that, throws him down, and the solution is solved. And so when you're reflecting on the state of the Ummah and you see Muslims and countries and situations where they're streaming down the river, ask yourself, what mad thing is doing this? I don't even want to see it's a madman. It might be a madman. <laughs> but Allah, I don't know where that madman is. There's multiple madmen. Sometimes you just blame some madman. There's multiple madmen. It's always men. It's not women that are mad. It's just men. <laughs> and so you look at the cause. And once you start focusing on the causes of things and solving it from the cause, you don't have problems in your life. Anytime you live your life at focusing on the effect, you will never be able to solve it. You'll never be able to solve the solution by living your life trying to save those bodies coming down the river. You've got to find out what's causing it. And that's where you need to work on in life. And so working that in your own life. Some people say, oh, it's the big corporations, the Walmarts that are doing this to us. You know, it's this and that. But that's just the effect. What is the actual cause of the situation that we're in? And once you start going into your own life and saying that, what am I going to do? And how can I cause my future? How can I cause where I want to drive in life? Then happiness is yours. I still have, I just want to say one last thing too. One last thing. <clears throat> and that is the illusion of happiness. 
This is super fundamental, okay? This is so fundamental. Are you ready for this one? Right, this is like so fundamental that I even, it's, it's the number two uh, conclusion. We have this belief that somewhere, somehow, there's a paradise on earth. That some, you, that you, people have this notion that, or this belief, which messes them up. That at some point in life, they will make just enough money to forever be happy. Or they will um, eat just enough shawarma sandwiches that they will never hope for another shawarma sandwich. Or they will have just the right car that they will forever be happy after that car. Or they will just hear the sweetest thought, the sweetest words from their husband or wife, and they will feel love for the rest of their life. Wake up. <laughs> life is not like that. And I think even as I say it, you know that life's not like that. Life is toil. Life is toil. If you want to like just write that on a piece of paper or something like that. Life is life is toil. This is a station, an abode of work. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ خَلَقُنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَد That indeed we created humanity in toil. In work. Just how you feel when you're, you know, digging something, that's what life is about. And once you understand it, then you might find the happiness that you're looking for. Because everybody in life is working. It's just that some are working smartly and some are working dumbly, if that's a word, <laughs> right? Some people are working for the hereafter and some people are working for an elusive happiness in the life that they're never going to find. But everybody's working. Everybody's working. Find the person in the biggest mansion with all the success in, 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 that you would imagine that someone could have. Ask him, are you happy? He will say, no, I'm feeling a little down today. With the biggest, everything in life that you could possibly have, he's still in toil. Once we understand that life is toil, then we understand that if I'm going to be working, then let me work smartly. Let me work to secure Allah's love for me. So that when I die, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with me. And He says, يَا أَيَّتُهَا النَّفْسُ الْمُطْمَئِنَّ إِرْجِعِي إِلَىٰ رَبِّكِ رَاضِيَةً مَرْضِيَةً فَدْخُلِي فِي عِبَادِي وَدْخُلِي جَنَّتِي جزاكم الله خيرا.